time out for another quiz. So we are picking up with the beginning of Act 2, and I think we're going to be able to maybe get all the way through um, Act 2 today. We're actually going to skip um, a bit at the beginning of it, and I want to pick up on page 1628 in your text when Ophelia comes in to talk to Polonius. Um, I'll say this about the beginning of the act, that the part that we're skipping. Polonius is talking to Reynaldo, and he sends Reynaldo somewhere to do something. Anybody remember what it is he's sending Reynaldo to do? Spy to, exactly, to spy on his son. This gets to that theme of spying that I was talking about the first day. He's sending him off to Paris to see if his son is doing what he told him to do when he gave him those um, words of advice. Okay, So Ophelia comes in. And notice he says, Polonius says, line 73, How now, Ophelia, what's the matter? By asking her what's the matter, that's Shakespeare's way of telling us that Ophelia ought to come onto the stage and look, to, look a little distressed, look upset. Okay? She said, oh, my Lord, my Lord, I've been so frightened. With what in the name of God? As I was sewing in my closet, her bedroom, Lord Hamlet, with his doublet all embraced, no hat upon his head, his stockings fouled, unguarded, down jive to his ankle, pale as his shirt, his knees knocking each other, he comes before me. Everything she's just described, okay? Hamlet, doublet all embraced, and you got a gloss down there, wherever it is. What is that, line 70 something? Close fitting coat, okay? That is, it's, it's not buttoned or tied up. His, no hat on his head, his stockings fouled, that is, they roll him down so that they're kind of down around his ankles. Okay, Each of these three images, as well as the stockings ungartered um, and his knees knocking together, these were images that were used in the Middle Ages um, literally to describe someone suffering from love sickness. Okay. That's literally. Medically, that is in the real world, love sickness was an actual diagnosis. You could be sick in love. And it resulted in these kinds of symptoms. So, in polite society, when a man would go into a room, you know, with a group of women, etc., men wore hats. They didn't take them off. Okay? They had their doublets, which is like an outer shirt, all nicely buttoned or tied all the way up to the neck. Their stockings, just you know, look at pictures and portraits and such, they're wearing like leggings, are gartered all the way up at the hip. His are untied. Why? He's so mad crazy in love for her, she thinks he couldn't even pay attention to getting dressed properly in the morning. Okay? So, notice Polonius immediately assumes what this means. Mad for thy love? Mad, lunatic, not angry, out of his mind. I, I do not know, but truly I do fear it. What did he say? He took me by the wrist and held me hard, so he grabs her by the, by the hands. Then goes he to the length of his arm. So he has her by the wrist, and he does this kind of a thing. Pulls her arm extended. His arm is extended. And with his other hand, thus over his brow, like this. So he kind of extends, and then he looks at her. He falls to such perusal of my face as it would draw it. That is, he's looking at her like an artist would. Like he's got to get every feature down. Long steady, so at last, a little shaking in my arm, thrice his head, thus waving up and down, he raised his sides so pretty so profound, as it did seem to shatter all his bulk, he goes out. Notice, doesn't say a word. 
Come with me. We, we got to go talk to the king. All right? And he says, what else did you do? She said, well, I, I did as you commanded. I did repel his letters and denied his access to me. In other words, he keeps sending me letters, and I keep sending them back. Not, not like through a postal service. It's like he slides them under her door, or she slides them under his door. He slides them back under her door. He slides them under her door, she slides them back under his door. Okay? He says, that's it. That's made him mad. That's made him crazy. I'm sorry that with better heat and judgment, I had not quoted him. I feared he did but trifle. Feared but trifle. He did but what? He said earlier, earlier, the letter songs, love tokens were all what? Springs to catch woodcocks, traps. It wasn't serious. Now Polonius thinks, well, that's pretty cool. Hamlet really loves her. But now it's crazy because of that. Okay? So he says, we're going to go talk to the king about this. We see scene two. King comes in with Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, two of Hamlet's friends, and the king and the queen beg Rosencrantz and Guildenstern to stay at Elsinore and to do what? So by your companies, line 14, to draw him on to pleasures and to gather so much as from occasion you may glean, whether aught to us unknown afflicts him thus. In other words, they're there for what purpose? They're going to spy on him. They're going to go about their daily business. It's not spying like they're hiding in bushes. It's spying in the sense they're going to go about, so to speak, with their daily business with Hamlet, and they're going to use certain questions to try to figure out what. What's really going on in the world? Something that might be hidden, Claudius says, from us. So they say, okay, we'll do that. Polonius comes in. Okay, Polonius tells the king, I know what's wrong with Hamlet. Some ambassadors come in. They leave. And Polonius goes on with what he wanted to tell the king. Line 85, page 1631. My liege and madam, to expostulate what majesty should be, what duty is, why day is day, night, night, and time is time, were nothing but to waste night, day, and time. Therefore, since brevity is the soul of wit, and tediousness the limbs and outward flourishes, I will be brief. Your noble son is mad. Mad call I it, or to define true madness, what is it but to be nothing else but mad? The queen. More matter, less art. Get to the point. In other words, you love to hear your voice. He says, I swear I use no art on art. No art at all. That he is mad, tis true, tis true, tis pity. And pity, tis, tis true. Okay. So, why is he mad? I have a daughter. Line 106. Have while she is mine. Go back to a Midsummer Night's Dream. What does Aegeus say about Hermia? She's mine to do with as I will. Okay? Same mentality here. So, who in her duty and obedience, Mark hath given me this. And he shows them a letter from Hamlet with a poem written on it. They read it. And the king says, but how hath she received his love? What, what do you think of? King wants to know, what did she do when Hamlet proclaimed his love for her? Notice Polonius doesn't just automatically answer. He says, what do you think of me? I, I think you're a man faithful and honorable. Well, I would prove so. And he goes on and says a whole bunch of stuff about how Hamlet is mad. He says, no, once I found out, I went to work, line 138. I told her, Lord Hamlet is a prince out of thy star. This must not, out of thy star means he's out of your range. You, you can't hope for that. So he says, I gave her prescripts that she should lock herself from his resort, admit no messengers, receive no tokens, cut off all communication, is what he means. She did 
And he repelled and fell into a madness. You really think so? The queen might be. Polonius, have there been such a time where I have positively said, tis so, and it proved otherwise? In other words, have I ever been wrong? King, not that I know. Take this from this, if this be otherwise. Take my head from my shoulders, if I'm wrong. That's Shakespeare's way of doing a little bit of foreshadowing. Okay? It won't be the king taking his head, and he won't actually be losing his head, but he will be dying fairly shortly. So, how may we try it further? The king asks. How can we prove your supposition? Listen to this language. You know, sometimes he walks four hours together in this lobby. Now, this lobby isn't like a lobby that you would normally think of, like a hotel lobby. If you go to some of the quote-unquote royal houses in England today, Hampton Court Palace, for example, or Buckingham Palace. <coughs> Hampton Court Palace was Henry VIII's palace. Buckingham Palace, you know, the Queen's residence in London. And you go to some of the rooms in there, and some of the rooms, the rooms, are as long as Peck Hall is wide. So you're talking 100-foot rooms, okay? That's how he can walk for four hours. He walks up and down, just paces. Tells us a little bit about Hamlet. What kind of person walks inside a room for four hours straight? What must you be doing while you're doing that? You're thinking, all right? So, he walks for four hours at a time in the lobby. So he does, says the queen. Hamlet, at such a time, I'll loose my daughter to him. Now, loose implies what? Give, what else? Let go, but what does let go imply? Keep going, go back to the opposite of give, loose, and let go. She's bound, she's controlled. It's almost like, because of the language, she's on a leash. When you say I will loose my, usually the word that comes next? Dogs, I loose my dogs on them. They're gonna go on a hunt. I'm not saying Ophelia is a dog or that he's referred to her as a bitch or anything like that. I'm saying Ophelia is now becoming part of the spine. All right. At such a time, I'll lose my daughter to him. Be you and I behind an heiress then. An heiress is a curtain. Shakespeare stage. was somewhat like this, and it had at least two doorways in the back, okay? The two big pillars right here, holding up a roof over that part of the stage. It's got at least two doorways. The doorways are usually, not all the times, covered with a curtain. The curtain, when it's a doorway doorway, is open. If the doorway is kind of representing on the stage a large window, the curtain is closed. Okay? So he's saying, sometime when Hamlet is getting ready for that four-hour walk, we'll set Ophelia on him, and we're going to stand behind the curtain and do what? Spy. Eavesdrop. But notice, standing behind the curtain, they are physically on the stage. You can see their feet, okay? And we'll mark the encounter. We'll watch it. If he love her not, be not from his reason fallen thereon, let me be no assistant for a state. Okay, we'll do it. So Hamlet comes in reading a book. Polonius, away. I'll board him presently. Board, a cost. It's a naval term. It's the term you use when two ships come close to each other and you throw a plank across so you can go across and try to take control of the other ship. Okay? 
So it's a naval term that has that meaning. So what does Polonius say? I'm going to try to take control of him. So, do you know me, my lord? Why does Polonius ask him that? Of course he knows him. Because he thinks he's crazy. Excellent, well, you are a fishmonger. Your gloss. An opprobrious expression meaning bawd, procure. Come on, use modern English. A pimp. That's what it means. You're a pimp. Not I, my lord. In other words, what you, how dare you? Then I wouldn't you were so honest a man. Honest, my lord? I, sir, to be honest as this word goes, is to be one man picked out of 10,000. Remember what Puck said about true lovers. One out of a million men is a true lover, an honest, faithful lover. Okay? Hamlet is saying one out of 10,000 men is honest. So why does he say a pimp is an honest man? No, he's not playing paradox. You go to a pimp, you know what you're getting, right? You go to a car, used car salesman. Sorry for you know, you car, used car salesman. You go to a used car salesman, you're not exactly sure. I mean, you may not know the quote unquote quality of what you're getting if you go to a pimp, I guess. So, Hamlet says the comment about what true out of one of 10,000. Paul says, yeah, that's true. For if the sun breed maggots in a dead dog, being a good kid seem carry it. What the heck is he talking about? How can the sun breed maggots? He's talking about the old idea that when you see a rotted carcass on the side of a road, somebody's killed a deer and they haven't taken all of it, and it's got maggots just crawling all over. How do the maggots get there? They used to think. The sun shining its beam down upon that maggot, uh, that carcass, impregnated it with maggot stuff. And the maggots were the result of the sunbeams, right? So, if the sun breed maggots in a dead dog, being a good kissing carrion, have you a daughter? What's the connection? Hamlet's going to not quite explain, but he'll get to it. I have. Let her not walk in the sun. Does he need to say any more? If the sun can breed maggots in a dead dog, you better keep your daughters out of the sun. Because the sun might do the same thing. Let her not walk in the sun. Conception is a blessing. But as your daughter may conceive, friend, look to it. Now he's applying conception outside marriage, because obviously the son doesn't marry. Polonius gets an aside to the audience. Notice his language. How say you by that? Still harping on my daughter, yet he knew me not at first. Said as a fishmonger. He's far gone. For God, and truly in my youth, I suffered much extremity for love. In other words, he is head over heels crazy, you know, but I remember being in love. I, you know, get some serious crazy. What do you read? Because remember, Hamlet came in with a little book. What do you read, my lord? Words, words, words. What is the matter, my lord? Between who? Hamlet takes the word matter to mean what is the conflict between? That is, he's playing on words. Polonius takes matter to mean what is the matter, the content of what you're reading. I, I mean the matter that you're reading. Oh, slanders. For the satirical rogue says here that old men have gray beards, that their faces are wrinkled, their eyes perching thick amber and plum tree gum, and that they have a plentiful lack of wit together with most weak hands. Okay, now none of that's false. Old men often do have gray beards, wrinkled faces, the whole nine yards. 
All which, sir, though I most powerfully and potently believe, yet I hold it not honesty to have it thus set down. I believe all that's true, but I don't think it's right to write it down. Why? For yourself, sir, should be as old as I am, if, like a crab, you could go backward. Is Polonius older than Hamlet? Age-wise, in physical human? Yes, he is. Because Polonius' daughter, it's implied, is somewhat near Hamlet's age. We don't know Polonius' daughter's actual age. We do know Hamlet's, we find out in Act 5. So what does Hamlet mean, you would be as old as I am if you could go backwards? Well, let's just say Hamlet's 20, university student. Say he's 25, he's a graduate student. If he could go Hamlet's age 25 and go then backwards in years, not 24, 23, 22, 21, but you take that 25 and essentially double it, Hamlet would say you would be as old as I am. Is Hamlet saying he's really 50? No. He's kind of suggesting he's crammed a lot into his whatever number of years he has. Polonius. Though this be madness, yet there is method in it. In other words, I don't get what he means, but he clearly means something. This is not the ravings of a lunatic. Will you walk out of the air, my lord? Will you leave the room and go outside on the balcony? Is what Polonius is asking. Hamlet takes him to mean something else entirely. Into my grave? Indeed, that's out of the air. Because if you're no longer in this stuff, then you're down in that stuff. How pregnant sometimes his replies are. Pregnant means what? Full of meaning, teeming with meaning, ready to burst forth with meaning. A happiness and often madness hits on which reason and sanity could not so prosperously be delivered. And he says, so I'm going to leave him and try to figure out the means of getting my daughter with him. I will most humbly take my leave of you. You cannot, sir, take from me anything that I will more willingly part with all. In other words, I really wish you would leave. You can't take your leave from me because I willingly give that away. Accept my life. Accept my life. Accept my life. That you can't willingly take from me. All right? So, Polonius leaves, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern come in. Again, what's their purpose? Spy. <clears throat> Spy. Pump him for information. <clears throat> so, Hamlet asks him, how are you? Is the indifferent children of the earth, indifferent there meaning ordinary, that is, we're, we're doing okay. Guildenstern, happy in that we are not over happy. On fortune's cap, we are not the very bucky. Fortune, the goddess fortune, um, medieval literature, Renaissance literature, had a wheel that she always had with her. The wheel represents kind of the passage of human time. When he says, we are not the very button on fortune's cap, he means we're not at the top of Fortune's wheel. Fortune's wheel is turning this way. Okay? So you have the top and the bottom. What happens when you get to the bottom of Fortune's wheel? We say today, oh, that's bad luck. That is unfortunate. The words fortunate and unfortunate imply this, even though we consciously today have no awareness of that. So, he says, on fortune's cap, we're not the very button. That's, that's not bad, because it's not bad to be either here or here, but it's better to be here than here. Why? What direction is it moving? 
You're sinking. This is, you know, you made a billion dollars and the stock market crashes. Okay. So, Hamlet says, nor the soles of her shoe. So you're not down here either. So we're not up here. We're not down here. Neither, my lord, says Rosencrantz. Oh, then you live about her waist or in the middle of her favors. So now represent fortune as a woman because it's repeatedly she. Not on her cap, nor on her shoes, but around her middle. Her waist. <laughs> Faith. Her private sweet. Yeah, that is a dirty joke. We hang around fortune's privates. Hammer in the secret parts of fortune. Oh, most true. She is a strumpet. Why is for strumpet means whore, slut. Okay. Why is fortune a slut? What does fortune do? Sleeps with everybody and everything. This is not only humans. This is all time. Mountains rise, mountains fall. <laughs> okay. What's the news? What's going on? Don't know. Well, world's grown honest. Hamlet then is doomsday in the air. Come on, but that's not true. Why are you here? So they should be back in Wittenberg, where Hamlet is supposed to be. Why are you here? What does he call here, Denmark? A prison. Denmark's a prison? Gildenser, prison, my lord? Denmark's a prison. Rosengrad, then is the world one. Hamlet, goodly one, in which there are many confines, wards, and dungeons, Denmark being one of the worst. We think not so, my lord. In other words, we don't think Denmark's a prison. We don't think the world's a prison. Why, then tis none to you. For there is nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. To me, it is a prison. Now, this is where, ha where Shakespeare has gone from mere punning to the heights of philosophical inquiry. What is real? That is, what is really real? And how do you know it's really real? <coughs> Hamlet says, thinking makes things good or bad. <clears throat> that they are not objectively good or bad. Okay? Rosencrantz and Gildenstern, we don't think Denmark's that bad. Hamlet, well, then it's not to you. To me, it's horrible. Well, what's the difference for Denmark, or excuse me, what's the difference regarding Denmark to Rosencrantz and Gildenstern, and to Hamlet. They were never supposed to be king. He was. Their mother hasn't remarried. His is. Their father wasn't murdered. His was. By his brother. His was. Who married his mother. His did. Hamlet's thinking about all this stuff. What did he say after he saw the ghost? I'll wipe away all songs, all men, everything, and put in there, kill Claudius. Why, then, your ambition makes it one. That's why Denmark's prison for you. It's too small for your mind. What he means by that is not necessarily Hamlet's ambition to be king, Though that's implied, I think it also means, Hamlet, you need to deflate your head a little bit. You got a bit of an ego going on there. Oh, God. I could be bounded in a nutshell and count myself a king of infinite space. Were it not, I have bad dreams. Denmark's not a large country. It's a pretty small country. Hamlet is saying, you can confine me, in a nutshell, woman shell, let's say, this four square foot place. You can 
bind me in that. And I would be a king of infinite space. Except for what problem? I have bad dreams. Where do the bad dreams come from? Not from within this infinite space. They come from without. Right? Hamlet's saying, where do these bad dreams come from? Gildenstern, which dreams indeed are ambition, for the very substance of the ambitious is merely the shadow of the dream. The substance, okay, the realness of a dream is what? Of this particular dream. It is the, uh, of, of the ambition, is the shadow of a dream. The very essence of your ambition is what? Your desire for something more. Hamlet, Hamlet, the dream is a shadow. Truly. And I hold ambition of so airy and light a quality that it is but a shadow's shadow. The shadow of a shadow. In other words, how much reality does ambition have? None. Okay. Then are our beggars bodies and our monarchs and outstretched heroes the beggars shadows. Now, he's going to talk about beggars, bodies, monarchs later on in Act 5 in the grave digger scene. It's pretty important because Hamlet's not just using that for rhetorical effect and such. So, you want to go to the court? Basically, whatever you want to do. Okay? But again, why'd you come? Why are you here? Well, to visit you. No, no other occasion. No, I, I don't think so. Come on. May I speak? What should we say, my lord? What does Hamlet want from them? What's Hamlet want from everybody? Honesty. Honesty. Why anything but to the purpose? That is, what do I want from you? Oh, you can tell me anything. Just don't tell me the truth. Okay. That, he's being facetious. He's being sarcastic. You were sent for. And there's a kind of confession in your looks which your modesties have not crafted enough to color. And as soon as I said you were sent for, your face gave it away. I know the good king and queen have sent me. To what end, my lord? That is, to what purpose? That you must teach me. You tell me what the purpose is. But let me conjure you by the rights of our fellowship, constant every use, et cetera, et cetera. Whether you were sent for or no, what do you think we should do? Hamlet, okay, never mind. We were sent for. And Hamlet says, thank you. I will tell you why. Now I'm going to tell you why you were sent for. I have of late, but I've wherefore I know not, lost all my mirth, Forgone all custom of exercises, and indeed it goes so heavily with my disposition, he says, that this goodly frame, the earth seems to me a sterile promontory, this most excellent canopy, the air, look you, this brave overhanging firmament, this majestical roof, fretted with golden fire, why, it appears nothing to me but a foul and pestilent congregation of papers. Okay? Back up a little bit. I've lost all mirth, foregone all custom of exercises. Meaning, I don't exercise or do the things I normally would do during the course of a day or a week or a month. Modern reading of this would say, Hamlet is depressed. He has no joy in life. He doesn't know why he gets up every morning. But he doesn't do what he normally does. That's a key symptom of depression. When you just can't kind of face the world. Okay? In fact, he says the world is what? It sucks. It is full of foul and pestilent congregation of vapors. 
What a piece of work is man. What a piece of work is a man. How noble in reason, how infinite in faculties. In form and moving, how express and admirable. In action, how like an angel. All this language is, man, we are pretty good. And he means all humanity. It doesn't just mean males. He's saying, look at any person. And it's like looking at a god. In apprehension, how like a god, the beauty of the world, the paragon of animals. And yet, to me, what is this quintessence of dust? Quintessence, its ultimate reality. And God made Adam out of the dust of the ground. That's it. Book of Genesis. From dust thou art, and to dust shalt thou return. So, Hamlet says, look at what this piece of dirt is capable of. And yet, we are all just mud. Man delights not in vain. I don't take any pleasure. And notice he has to go, And notice he has to go, no, nor women either, though by your smiling you seem to say so. I, I didn't think that, my lord. Why did you laugh then? When I said man delights not me. I mean, well, to think if you delight not a man, then what lent and entertainment the players shall receive from you. That is, he says, well, if you don't take any pleasure in human activity, then what kind of pleasure are you going to take when the actors come. So he's telling Hamlet, there's an acting troupe on its way. Really? Hamlet says. Cool. So, we have the players come in, and Polonius welcomes them and such. Um, Hamlet addresses the players, and the first, first player demonstrates his ability, page 1640. And let's see here. Hamlet has Polonius give the players a place to um, stay and such. And then he asks the first player to come here for a moment. Bottom of 1641. It says, um, can you play the murder of Gonzaga? I might. By naming the play, and the first player is saying, I, my lord, that's telling us the first player knows this play. Okay? And um, Hamlet says, can you, can you add a speech of some dozen, 16 lines or so? Would that have any problem? He goes, yeah, no problem. Very good. They all leave, and they leave Hamlet alone on the stage. So Hamlet gets a soliloquy. Now I am alone. Oh, what a rogue and peasant slave am I. Is it not monstrous that this player here, but in a fiction and a dream of passion, could force his soul so to his own conceit that from her working all his visage wan? That is, from his acting, his face went pale. This is how good an actor he is. Tears in his eyes, distraction in his aspect, a broken voice, and his whole function suiting with forms to his conceit, his make-believe, if you want, his idea. And all for nothing. He could do all of this. For nothing. Why for nothing? Because for Hecuba. What's Hecuba to him? Were he to Hecuba that he should weep for her? Hecuba was the queen of Priam, prince of Troy. He was playing the part of Priam when he did that little passage with the tears and the pale face and everything. And Hamlet said, he could do all this for what? Nothing. Because Hecuba isn't real. 
What's Hamlet getting at? What did he say to his mother when she said, Hamlet, put off thy knighted color? And he goes on and he talks about his cloak, his tears, his sighs, his looking at the ground, and all of that is what? These are things that passive show. These are actions a man might play. Well, we've just seen actions a man might play. Yet I, Hamlet goes on, a dull and muddy meddled rascal, peep like John of Dreams, unpregnant of my cause, he can say nothing. No, not for a king, upon whose property in most of your life a damned defeat was made. That is, that king was defeated damnably. That's a damned defeat. Am I a coward? Who calls me villain? Has anybody called him villain? Nope. Has anybody called him coward? Nope. Who breaks my paint across, plucks off my beard, blows it in my face? These are all examples of things that could elicit a violent response. Shakespeare's day, these are all things that could cause a knight to whip out a sword and fight you right then and there. Pulling his beard seems kind of silly to us, but in Shakespeare's day, that's flipping them off. But in Shakespeare's day, that's death. That's cause enough to kill. Yeah, you might still get in trouble with the law, but people are going, yeah, but he flipped him off, and that's like, you know, saying bad things about his mama. <laughs> Breaks my paint across, hitting somebody over the head, plucks off my beard, blows it in my face, tweaks me by the nose, gives me the lie in the throat, as deep as to, who, who, who has done any of this stuff? Zwoons, I should take it. Zwoons, by God's wounds. For it cannot be, but I am pigeon livered and lack gall to make oppression bitter, or ere this I should have fanned all the region kites with this slave's offer. What? Or ere this, or before now, I should have what? Fanned all the region kites, all the regions. Birds of prey and scavenging birds. With what? This slave's awful. Who's the this slave? Claudius. I should have killed him and scattered his body parts to the wide earth. Not giving him decent burial so that the birds could eat it. Bloody, body villain. Remorseless, treacherous, Lecherous, kindless, kindless, not like nature, villain. Oh, vengeance. What an ass am I. This is most brave that I, the son of a dear father murdered, prompted my revenge by heaven and hell. Any problem with that statement? Prompted to my revenge by heaven and hell. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Okay? And Christ says what? Somebody smacks you on the cheek, do what? Here's the other one. Someone takes your cloak, your coat, give, do what? Give them your shirt also. That's the, you know, that's the revenge tragedy. It's not quote unquote Christian revenge tragedy. Must I, I must, like a whore, unpack my heart with words and fall out cursing like a very drab. Fie upon it. Compel my brains, and he ought to be smacking himself in the head. Why? We're where? We're almost to Act Three. What has Hamlet not done? Louder. Kill Claudius. He was told, Act One, kill Claudius. In Seneca's revenge tragedies, pretty much when the guy finds out, kill so and so, it happens pretty soon. And then a whole bunch.
bunch of other people get killed as repercussions from that. And what did you come up with? You know, I've heard that guilty creatures sitting at a play have by the very cunning of the scenes instruct to the soul that presently they proclaimed their malefactions. What do we have there almost? You guys are all too young to remember it, unless it's those available reruns. The old Perry Mason TV show that I grew up watching, Perry Mason was this um, lawyer, okay, and he'd always get somebody on the stand. He'd be a defense attorney. He'd always get somebody on the stand. You know, his uh, client was like a piece of murder or something. And there'd be some somewhat innocuous person he'd get on the stand and just start drilling them until they'd finally, the last two minutes of the show, I did it. I killed her. He was a rotten asshole. Okay. Kind of because he would mentally do a play in front of that person. So Hamlet says, I will do this play in the, within the play for what purpose? Because the spirit that I have seen may be the devil. That is, my father's ghost might not actually be my father's ghost. And the devil hath power to assume a pleasing shape. How do we know that? Because St. Paul says that. Can appear as an angel of light. John says in his first epistle, try the spirits, test them, make sure where they come from. And the devil hath power to assume a pleasing shape, yea, and perhaps out of my weakness, my melancholy, as he is very potent with such spirits, abuses me to damn me. Maybe this isn't a Christian spirit asking me to do this, but maybe this is the devil trying to get me to hell. So, I'll have grounds more relative than this. That is, just the ghost's word. If I can get Claudius to admit to it, then I can run him through. You know, with a good, clean conscience. Okay? The play's the thing wherein I'll catch the conscience of the king. Act 3. We see the king and queen, Ophelia, Rosencrantz, Gildenstern, and Lords. So, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern tell the king and queen what they gathered from Hamlet, but they also say, you know, his spirits seem to pick up a little bit with the actors coming in. So, the king tells um, Gertrude she needs to leave. He says, we're going to Use Hamlet to affront Ophelia. And we will, her father and myself, line 32, lawful as spies. We will lawfully spy. I don't know about you, but NSA, CIA, FBI, it's that kind of will. We'll so bestow ourselves that seeing unseen, we may have their encounter frankly judge. Okay. So, Polonius tells Ophelia where to walk. Queen leaves. And then Polonius says, just before they leave, we are off to blame in this, tis much, too much proved, that with devotion's visage and pious action, we do sugar o'er the devil. With devotion's visage, with pious, saintly look on our face, and pious action, we go to the church, we do what? We try to sugarcoat the rottenness within. King, oh, tis true. How smart a lash that speech doth give my conscience. So, Polonius and the king withdraw, and Hamlet comes in. Where's Ophelia? She is standing on the stage. She is standing on the stage, in fact, with a book. So if the people don't see her, they should at least see the book. I know, that sounds pretty silly. But what does this imply? This is not a soliloquy. Hamlet comes out, and I've not seen one yet that does this. If I were directing Hamlet, I would have Hamlet do this. 
Hamlet comes out and just glances up and sees Ophelia and then delivers the speech. Taken by some, taken by many, to be the greatest soliloquy in the entire English language. But it's not a soliloquy because he's not alone on the stage. Therefore, we can't say this is Hamlet's true inner thought. But the, oh, that this too, too sullied flesh would melt? That is. That's the speech that tell, is telling us Hamlet's considering suicide. To be or not to be. That is the question. Whether tis nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against the sea of troubles and by opposing in them. Those are the two choices. To take up arms and fight one's enemies, even if those enemies aren't physical, but are spiritual or internal ideas. Or to do what? <clears throat> to take yourself out of a battle entirely. To kill yourself. Well, here's what you get if you kill yourself. By opposing in them to die, to sleep. No more. And by sleep to say we end the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to. Tis a consummation devoutly to be wished. Who wouldn't want to be rid of the problems of this life? Hamlet is saying. To die. To sleep. To sleep chance to dream. Alright, here's the problem. Remember, I could be a king of infinite space were it not for I have bad dreams. For in that sleep of death, what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil must give us pause. There is the respect that makes calamity of so long life. For who would, whip, who would bear the whips and scorns of time, the oppressor's wrong, the proud man's contumely, that is, the proud man's looking down his nose at you, the pangs of despised love, that is, unrequited love, the law's delay, justice delayed is justice denied, the insolence of office, you get some power-hungry, you know, cop who stops you and abuses you in one way or another, and the spurns that mer patient merit of the unworthy takes, when he himself might his quietus make with a bare bodkin. That is, and you can stop all of these problems with one knife. Who would fartles bear to grunt and sweat under weary life but that the dread of something after death? The undiscovered country from whose born no traveler returns does what? The dread, if that door is death, the dread of, life, of what lies beyond the door is what? Puzzles the will. What does it mean to puzzle the will? You're indecisive. Makes you indecisive. And makes us rather bear those ills we have than fly to others that we know not of. I'd rather take the problems I have here don't know what lies behind door number three. What if the myth, let's say, the Christian myth is true, and door number three leads to heaven or hell? What if you don't know which one you're going to? You don't want to make the wrong decision, right? Then go out and sink. You want to go out and rise on the escalator. Okay, we'll pick up there on Wednesday. Come on, big dog.